Good evening and welcome to this very special event featuring Laura Rockland as Jane Austen. I'm sorry it took us a moment to get started there. We had a little bit of internet trouble, but hopefully we're good to go for now. I am Sarah Holliday, the head of events at the New York Society Library, and I'm just here to explain a couple of things about uh, how this format works. Um, first of all, let me mention that we had been scheduled to host Ms. Rockland uh, involved in a play that she co-wrote called Clover this past May. Uh, obviously that had to be postponed due to obvious circumstances, um, but I am grateful to her for having come up with the idea for this evening's event um, when I came back and said, what is something that we can do online? Um, so this is a wonderful alternative idea and we're also thankful to Alexander Sanger for sponsoring this virtual event in honor of Jeanette Watson Sanger. So, in a moment, I will vanish from your screen and Ms. Rockland will appear as Jane Austen and she will give a presentation and then take your questions um, about the world of the play. Um, you will see probably on the right of your screen, a chat area. You're very welcome to add to that throughout the event, um, comments, questions, particularly ones you might want her to address at the end. Um, and after the main part of her presentation, She'll speak to some of those. Um, just a word about Ms. Rockland. Laura Rockland holds an undergraduate degree in theater and English literature from Middlebury College and a recent Master's of Fine Arts from the Shakespeare Company's Academy for Classical Acting at the George Washington University. She's performed with Olney Theater Center's National Players and in the DC area with Roundhouse Theater and Chesapeake Shakespeare Company, as well as regional companies across the country, concentrating especially on Shakespeare and adaptations of classics. She also spent a summer at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London for their Shakespeare Certificate Program. I'm now delighted to present Laura Rockland as Miss Jane Austen. I am all amazement. I. Jane Austen, the daughter of an obscure country parson, have just returned from a visit to Carlton House, the Prince Regent's London residence. Although House seems a somewhat inappropriate title for a place that has been quite aptly described as not inferior to the French Palace of Versailles. I must admit to feeling somewhat overwhelmed by such a display of grandeur, growing up as I did in the unostentatious surroundings of a quiet Hampshire village. Well, I was never so surprised in my life as I was to discover one morning that no less important personage than the Prince Regent's librarian, the Reverend Mr. Clark, had arrived at my brother Henry's home in London to call upon me and at the instigation of the Regent, no less. Imagine my astonishment when this formidable personage imparted his even more formidable message that... <clears throat> His Royal Highness is such a great admirer of your little books, and particularly of Pride and Prejudice, that he wishes to extend to you an invitation to visit his official residence. <laughs> well, the visit to the place itself was most interesting. Well, among the many flattering attentions which I received from the Reverend Mr. Clark was the information of my being at liberty to um, dedicate my future work to His Royal Highness without the necessity of any further solicitation on my part. Therefore, as my Emma is now nearing the time of her publication, she shall have the honor of being embellished with the name of the Regent. And my publisher, Mr. Murray, shall send an advanced copy to Mr. Clark to grace the library shelves at Carlton House. <laughs> I really must wonder if His Royal Highness is aware how very insignificant a lady he is honoured with these attentions. I believe I may boast myself to be, with all possible vanity, the most unlearned and uninformed female who ever dared to be an authoress. I was born in rural Hampshire on December 16th, 1775, in the little stone rectory at Steventon, where my father, the Reverend George Austin, was then the incumbent of the medieval stone church of St. Nicholas. He was what we then called a pluralist, meaning that he held more than one living at the same time, being simultaneously the rector of Steventon and of the neighboring parish of Dean, for which work he was paid the adequate, if not lavish sum of 600 pounds a year. My mother, 
Cassandra Austin was a well-educated woman with a talent for improvising occasional verse. And she early on instilled a love of poetry in me and in my brothers and sister. Indeed, I suppose we were always quite a literary family. I have most fond memories of my father reading to us from the poet Cooper in the evenings. There were eight of us little Austins, James, George, Edward, Henry, Charles, Francis, Cassandra, and me. We were all of us a close family, but my beautiful Cassandra and I were inseparable. Indeed, my mother used to say that if Cassandra were going to have her head cut off, Jane would insist on sharing her fate. And I believe she was quite right in that assessment. Both of our parents encouraged all of us to read widely of worthwhile literature, particularly Shakespeare, Johnson and Milton, with which our rectory library was well stocked. We were also known to dabble in the mere trash of the common circulating libraries in Basingstoke and Winchester. Such delicious frivolities as the gothic novels of Mrs. Radcliffe. I did my best as a girl to make my dear parents proud, but I fear that pictures of perfection make me sick and wicked. And there were times when I was tempted to rebel against the docile behavior expected of a clergyman's daughter. I recall one long summer evening when I was not yet 13 and I could not resist the temptation to make a few facetious entries in the parish register at Steventon Church. I believe I recorded among other things, the reading of the bands of marriage between Mr. Henry Frederick Howard Fitzwilliam of London and Miss Jane Austen of Steventon. Our names do sound well together, do they not? <laughs> you may recognize the name of my fictitious husband contains several of the names of future heroes of my novels, Henry Tilney, Frederick Wentworth and Fitzwilliam Darcy. It was also around this time that, with the encouragement of my brothers, James and Henry, who were then studying at Oxford, I began to try my hand at the composition of fiction. I began composing little stories and was successful enough with one entitled Love and Friendship, a particular favorite among my family, that I proceeded to produce a prodigious number of tales between the time I turned 13 and my 18th birthday, surely enough to fill three well-appointed volumes I remember being quite inspired by a little book with a very large title. A Father's Instructions, consisting of moral tales, fables, and reveries designed to promote the love of virtue. This little book exhorted its impressionable readers that they ought to frame tales, to display the power of imagination and the happy talent of relating familiar and trivial events with ease and elegance. Certainly, the life familiar to me has never ceased to spark my imagination to frame tales. But I would not have you think that my education had no structure and that I spent the entire of my girlhood roaming the fields of Hampshire with a book in my hand. When I was seven and Cassandra nine, we were sent away to school together, as was common with young ladies of our station. We started at Mrs. Crawley's school near Oxford but returned home when I was struck ill during an outbreak of putrid fever at the school. In its stead, our parents then sent us to the Abbey School in Reading, where we were to be educated alongside the daughters of other members of the landed gentry or gentlemen with the genteel profession, like our father, the clergyman. We completed this formal education a little after the time of my 10th birthday and returned home to Steventon to pursue our studies on our own, or with the occasional visiting instructor, Mr. George William Chard, the assistant organist at nearby Winchester Cathedral, rode over to Steventon to give us lessons in music, and the well-known watercolorist of Bath, Mr. John Claude Natz, gave us lessons in the art of drawing. <laughs> Cassandra and I shared a cheerful little sitting room adjoining our bedroom, with cheerful blue wallpaper and with blue striped curtains, and it was there that we pursued our studies on our own. In that room, we kept our writing desks, our favorite books, and our pianoforte, and spent many hours both usefully and pleasantly employed. But there were, of course, some distractions from the uninterrupted pursuit of knowledge, even in the wilds of Hampshire. 
Once we were of an age to be much in company, Cassandra and I attended monthly assembly balls in nearby Basingstoke at the town hall or at the Angel Inn. I recall one Christmas ball when I had just turned three and twenty. There were twenty dancers and I danced them all and without the least fatigue. But I had not thought myself equal to it, but I believe that in cold weather and with few couples, I could just as easily dance for a fortnight together as for half an hour. Such was my fondness for the amusement. My siblings and I, along with our cousin Eliza, were also very fond of staging amateur theatricals. <laughs> Cousin Eliza's arrival in Steventon did turn our quiet little world topsy-turvy and brought the violent events of the French Revolution, then occurring just across the channel, into our own peaceful little parlour. Cousin Eliza had been living on the continent since 1777, and it was there that she met Jean-Francois Capot de Foyed. He was a dashing young captain of dragoons in the regiment of the unfortunate Queen Marie Antoinette, and cousin Eliza was quite swept off her feet by him. They were married in 1781, and so my little cousin, Eliza Hancock, found herself swirling through the glittering society of pre-revolutionary France. Tragically, this happy daydream came to an end, as so many happy daydreams do, when the outbreak of revolution forced Eliza to flee to a family in England for asylum and sent her dashing young husband as a victim of Madame la Guillotine. Fortunately, none of these terrible events had come to pass during Eliza's first visits to us, and she quickly infused our quiet life in Steventon with her continental flair, turning our rectory barn into a theatre, and recruiting me and my brothers to aid her in the performance of amateur theatricals. Eliza adored any comedy of manners, and she played the role of leading lady with great joie de vivre and perilous charm. Well, in truth, two of my brothers fell victim to Eliza's manifold attractions. In an effort to work more closely with Eliza, my brother James began writing new prologues with which she was to open each of our performances, and he was quite successful in his attempts to ingratiate himself as two as the prologues he wrote, that to open Sheridan's The Rivals and Susan Sontley's The Wonder a Woman Keeps a Secret became particular favourites with Eliza. Even at such a young age, I was captivated by the life of the theatre, though on an amateur level. For the Christmas season of 1790, we produced two plays for the entertainment of our neighbours, The Sultan and High Life Below Stairs. <laughs> And I was so captivated by the possibilities inherent in theatrical expression that I attempted to adapt Samuel Richardson's novel, The History of Sir Charles Grandison for the Stage. I need only say about this attempt that it was the only time I wrote for the stage. <laughs> However, I soon did realize that the life in the theater can bring out weaknesses, even in the most respectable of persons, there are blurred lines between truth and pretense. Often amateur actors are not sufficiently experienced emotionally to distinguish between what affection is shown on stage is true affection and what is merely between the characters in the play. And this caused my poor brother Henry to believe that cousin Eliza returned his attachment to her. He pursued her successfully, but my poor brother James, who believed the same, I'm afraid was left with a broken heart However, fortunately, Henry and James were much too sensible animals to allow Cousin Eliza's giddiness to come between them for long. And I still have most happy memories of those days spent performing amateur theatricals in the barn, despite my warnings of the dangers of play acting through Mrs. Rushworth's misadventures in Mansfield Park. Most of our theatricals also included music at the beginning of the play and in the interval. And if you will indulge me, I would like to share one of my favorite songs with you now. Down by some crystal spring, where the nightingales sing, oh, pleasant it is in season to hear the groves ring. Down by the riverside, a young cat 
captain I espied, entreating of his true love for to be his bride. Dear Phyllis, said he, can you fancy me? My ship, she's unloaded, just coming from Spain. Well, despite all of our youthful artistic antics, most of my brothers went on to be quite successful in very serious professions. My brother James recovered from the broken heart he was left with by coquettish cousin Eliza and became a clergyman. He eventually came into my father's living in Steventon upon the occasion of my father's retirement in the year 1800. My brother Edward was fortunate in being adopted as a young man by our cousin, Mr. Thomas Knight and his wife of Godmersham in Kent. Well, the Knights were childless and having taken a fancy to Edward upon visits to us at Steventon, they proposed that they should adopt him and bring him up to be the heir to their estates in Kent and in Hampshire. I thought of this action when I wrote of Frank Churchill's adoption by his wealthy aunt in Emma. Edward now lives very happily the life of a country squire and has found himself a most lovely wife. And Elizabeth Bridges, oh, the daughter of Sir Brooke Bridges of Gunniston Park, which neighbours Edward's own estate in Kent. My brother Henry was fortunate in winning cousin Eliza's heart and hand, but he did have more difficulty in settling on any one profession. However, he never lost the spirit to try something new when one avenue became closed to him. He started out as a soldier lieutenant in the Oxfordshire militia, and his tales of life as a soldier were of great use to me in writing of Mr. Wickham and his comrades in Pride and Prejudice. From soldiering, he moved on to become a banker in London and was very successful during the Napoleonic Wars. However, the end of the war was also the end of the robust wartime economy, and when Henry found he was less successful as a banker than he might have wished, he turned to the church and joined my brother James as a clergyman. However, Henry's final decision to settle down did not come before he and cousin Eliza had quite an adventure. Well, they travelled to France shortly after their wedding to see if there were anything left of her first husband's property that might be salvaged in the wake of the revolution. Unfortunately for them, they were still in Paris, when in 1803, Napoleon revoked France's tenuous peace with England and British tourists were unable to leave the country. Fortunately, the ever resourceful Eliza had a plan. She situated Henry, whose French was never quite what it ought to have been, in the back of the carriage in the guise of an invalid. And Eliza took over directions for their journey with her impeccable French, passing them off as a French couple and allowing them to return safely home to England. My brother Francis has joined the Royal Navy. And though I know that my naval brothers often have a difficult time of it on the open sea, I am wont to remind Francis that his profession has its due sirs to make up for some of its privations. Well, to an inquiring mind such as his, those two sirs must be considerable. Having the ability to travel and to see the world is something that I have often envied my seafaring brothers. Well, Francis has been successful enough in his profession that he has been honored with the title of Sir Francis Austin. He came to particular notice when he was the senior lieutenant on the Lark, one of the ships sent to bring the, royal, the, the Prince Regent's bride-to-be to England for their wedding. Poor woman, I do not envy her. My brother Charles also joined the Royal Navy and like Francis has spent much of his life locked in England's long struggle with Napoleon. He has also risen through the ranks to become an admiral. At one point, he was even attached to the ship, the Indian, which was at the North American station. And he told us many tales of his time on the other side of the Atlantic when he returned home for visits. However, no matter what adventures the sea leads him into, dear Charles never forgets his sisters. 
where he used his prize money from capturing the privateer ship Scipio to buy beautiful amber crosses for Cassandra and for me. I remembered this kind action of his when I wrote of Fanny Price receiving the gift of a cross from her seafaring brother William in Mansfield Park. At present, I have occasion to consult my naval brothers frequently, as I have begun work on a new novel entitled The Elliots, which has a naval captain as its hero. Thus far, they've not objected to my mentioning their ships by name, particularly France's ship, The Elephant. I have done it, but it, it shall not stay if it makes them angry. The ships are only just mentioned. My poor brother George was unable to pursue a profession as he was slow to develop his, his mental faculties and my parents found it difficult to cope with the demands for caring for him at home. So they found him a suitable place in the village where he would be well looked after. Thus it was that by the year 1800, all of my brothers were out in the world and well situated. So it ought to have come as no surprise to me to be greeted with the news that my father intended to retire. And yet I was surprised, very much surprised, to be greeted with the news of his retirement and our family's removal to Bath as a fait accompli when I returned home from a short visit to my friend Martha Lloyd at Ipthorpe. I fear that when greeted with the news, I fainted dead away. I had spent the first 25 years of my life in our peaceful, lovely home in Steventon. And like my heroine, Anne Elliot, I, I could not imagine forming any new friendships in a city of invalids seeking to take the waters and fashionable young ladies seeking to take a husband that could recompense me for the friendships I would leave behind in Steventon. And yet my father was approaching his 70th year, and I suppose he'd earned the right to a little relaxation in a place of his choice. And so, my brother James was established as his locum tenens in Steventon, and my mother, Cassandra, and I were shuffled off to Bath. The greatest wrench inherent in moving house was that my father did not believe it practical to take our entire library from Steventon with us to our new lodgings in Bath. There were over 500 volumes with which he proposed to part. I wanted James to take them at the mere venture of a half guinea a volume, as he would be moving into the rectory anyway as the new curate. And he did oblige me by purchasing a few favourite volumes, but so many dear old books were lost to us forever that it quite makes my heart ache to think of it. Finding suitable lodgings in Bath was also no easy task. Finding rooms at a reasonable price, but in a genteel quarter of the town, proved to be of great difficulty. However, at length, we found an advertisement in the Bath Chronicle for the lease of number four, Sydney Place. The Chronicle promised that the flat was in a desirable location, the rent was very low, and the landlord was bound by contract to paint the first two floors that summer, so what more could we desire? Besides which, it would be very pleasant for me and Cassandra to be so near to the Sydney Gardens, we might take our morning constitutional in the labyrinth every day. <clears throat> Unlike my young and impressionable heroine, Catherine Morland, I did not form any romantic attachments amidst the giddy throngs of the assembly rooms in Bath. I've been told that my character and deportment are graceful, but quiet and unlikely to attract attention. And yet there have been one or two occurrences of a romantic character in my life that I do find worth remembering. Well, in general, I do not want people to be very agreeable, as that saves me the trouble of liking them a great deal. And yet, I have in my life received one proposal of marriage. It was from Mr. Harris Bigwither, a neighbour of my brother Edwards and Kent. Cassandra and I were staying with their family over the Christmas holidays in 1802. And late one Thursday evening, December 2nd, Harris proposed. He was 21 at the time and I 27. Well, at first, I accepted him. It would have been a very good thing for my mother and sister if I had married a man whose 
life is so useful, whose character and estate so estimable and worthy. And yet, in the dark watches of the night, I came to reconsider my willingness to give up my liberty without the requisite affection for my intended lord and master. And so the following morning, I had the unenviable task of resenting my acceptance of his kind proposal. I already knew that my books are my children. They provide me with sufficient interest for happiness. And, and to be honest, since my decision to refuse Mr. Bigwither, I have often triumphed over the married women of my acquaintance and rejoiced in my own freedom from care. Well, where a person wishes to attach, they should always be ignorant. To come with a well-informed mind is to come with an inability of administering to the vanity of others, which a sensible person would always wish to avoid. A woman especially, if she have the misfortune of knowing anything, should conceal it as well as she can. <laughs> Such sober reflections as those caused by Mr. Bigwither's proposal were no doubt a result of the fact that I was a staid old matron of seven and twenty at the time. When I made my debut at a ball at Enham House near Andover, at the age of 17 in 1792, I fear I was as giddy and flirtatious as any other young lady dancing her way down the set. Indeed, there was one young man whose charms were such that I found it difficult not to give rise to gossip. Cassandra cautioned me frequently from afar. <laughs> His name was Tom Lefroy, and he was a relation of our dear friend and my mentor, Mrs. Lefroy, who lived in the rectory at Ash and was our close neighbour at Steventon. Tom came to visit his aunt in the summer of 1796, and we soon gave calls for our names to be much coupled in gossip. Oh, imagine everything most profligate and shocking in the way of dancing and sitting down and talking together. <laughs> I was soon writing very flippant letters to Cassandra, who was staying with friends at some distance and was unable to be on hand as my chaperone. I recall writing to her that I looked forward with great impatience to the ball at Ash, as I expected to receive an offer from my friend in the course of the evening. I declared that I would refuse him, however, unless he promised to give away his white coat. It seems. The older generation were not as sanguine about our relationship as Tom and I were. And he was sent away shortly after that ball that no further damage might be done to my affections or to his reputation. I suppose I must accept that the daughter of an obscure country parson is no match for a rising London barrister. And, and yet his departure was very difficult medicine to swallow. It is yet hard for me to speak of my one other attachment of note. For some time after our removal to Bath, Cassandra and I long to spend summers by the sea. The hot weather in Bath keeps one in a continual state of inelegance. And so, in the summer of 1801, my father took me, Cassandra and my mother, to Lyme. It was there that I made the acquaintance of a most charming man. I never heard my sister speak of anyone else I fancied with such admiration. A mutual attachment was soon in progress between us, and when we parted, for he was a visitor to the seaside also, he was most anxious to know where we should be the next summer, saying that wherever it was, he should be there too. But before the next summer, he had been drowned in an ill-fated sea voyage. I was never to see him again. I cannot deny that this loss has also contributed to my unwillingness ever afterward to engage myself to another. But as I must leave off being young, I found there are some douceurs in being a sort of a chaperone. I am seated on the most comfortable sofa by the fire at assembly balls, and I may drink as much wine as I like. <laughs> Besides which, there is something delightful about aiding the young ladies who are entering society for the first time. There are so many niceties to be remembered to make a proper impression at assemblies. 
But would you care to learn a few of our traditions? If so, I will share them with you now. I fear you may not be able to see everything, as I understand from our kind hosts at the library that I am appearing in some sort of odd picture frame, but I shall do my best to demonstrate to you, and I hope that you will stand up and join me at home. So we shall begin with ladies. Now, you cannot see my feet, but you wish to have your heels together and your toes elegantly turned out. Oh, as though you were dancing in the Russian ballet. Then you want to fold your hands, but be careful to keep a nice circle. Corners are most unbecoming. You don't wish to look as though you're elbowing your way through a crowd. You also, ladies, wish to have your shoulders up and back. You want to show off your jewels. If you are dancing at a ball, you want to be sure that the gentleman can adequately decide how much you are worth per annum and whether you are a good speculation. <laughs> then keep your head high. Now, when I was younger and we were still wearing the full skirts that were fashionable at the end of the last century, we used to curtsy by simply bending our knees, again, as one might do with the ballet. But now that in the wake of the French Revolution and the revival of these classical, lovely flowing styles, Sometimes our skirts are too tight to be able to bend our knees in that fashion. So we have begun putting one foot behind the other and curtsying that way. Now this may be particularly difficult to see, but we shall make our best effort. If you are being presented at court, you wish to be able to go all the way to the floor. So you do your one foot behind the other and bend your knees until you have sunk to the ground. <laughs> Very elegant, I am sure. Now for gentlemen. This will be a bit more of a challenge without being able to see my legs. But the part that you wish to display to the most advantage is your well-turned calf muscle. If you are a gentleman of good standing, it means that you are able to do things such as fencing and riding and other sports that give you a very attractive and well-turned calf. I have it on good authority that there are some bows in town who've been known to pad their calf muscles. Be that as it may. In order to bow, you want to extend one leg and show yourself to your best advantage and then bend your back leg and bow forward. Once again, earlier in the century, you would want to be careful to keep your head up so that your wig might not fall off. But fortunately, they're no longer as much the fashion, so that's less of a concern these days. <laughs> I am sure that you all executed these courtesies brilliantly and that you would have made an excellent impression at the pump room and bar. But I must admit that it was with feelings of happy relief that my mother, Cassandra, and I, along with our friend Martha Lloyd, left Bath and removed to Southampton following my father's death. We chose Southampton because of its proximity to my naval brothers. My brother Francis had been put in charge of the ship, the St Albans, in 1807, which had that area as its home port, so we would therefore be close to him. <laughs> We ladies found a suitable house in Southampton on Castle Square with a most dramatic view of a new Gothic style folly, which the second Marquess of Lansdowne had built on the former Norman keep of Southampton Castle. <laughs> most atmospheric. I had 50 pounds to spend and with that small sum, I was able to amuse myself very adequately in the bustling town. In truth, it was a very exciting place to be when we arrived in the year seven. Preparations were being made to fortify all English ports against the threat of invasion by Napoleon. It was with bated breath that those of us left on shore followed the advancements of the naval battles occurring just outside of our reach. My brother Francis was present at the Battle of Vimiero on August 21st, 1808, which was the first engagement of the Peninsular War. And it was with bated breath that my mother sister and I waited for news of how they had fared. The following year, Francis and the St Albans were sent away to Spain to retrieve what was left of our poor troops whose situation seemed dreadfully critical. They had been forced to flee from Napoleon across the mountains. Thank heaven we had no one particularly to care for among the troops, no one known to us. And we were fortunate again in the return of my brother Charles from the North American station in 1811, just before war, war broke out with the young United States in 1812. Well, in truth, 
I did not think it wise for us to enter into a conflict with the Americans when our forces were already required in Europe. It seems to me that we will be giving the young United States just the practice they needed to become good soldiers and sailors and that we would gain nothing ourselves. But it seems that we were to be ruined and there was no help for it. Still, I put my hope of better things in the hands of God as a religious nation. And fortunately, by the outbreak of the War of 1812, my mother, Cassandra, and I had moved further inland to Chawton, where my brother Edward had made us the gift of a commodious six-bedroom cottage near his estate. It was a handsome, ah, here is the painting, a handsome square brick building that had been built at the end of the 17th century and was conveniently situated on the crossroads between Winchester, London, and Portsmouth, with a charming little pond out in front. And so it was that at this time in my life, at the age of 32, I for the first time had the leisure and peace to focus on my writing. I began my day with music, but after breakfast, I was able to sit at the little round table in the parlor and write until luncheon. I began by revising Eleanor and Marianne, which was to be published in Sense and Sensibility, then First Impressions, which would become Pride and Prejudice, then Mansfield Park was written, then Emma, and now I have begun work on the Elliots. The one thing I dread when at work is less dis interruption than discovery. So it was with great relief that I discovered there is a squeaky floorboard just outside of the parlor where I work. This kindly warning allows me to quickly cover my small sheets of writing paper with a sheet of blotting paper so that no one may enter and catch me at work on one of my tales. Well, in my younger days at Steventon, I did often read my work aloud, but now that my work has changed, I prefer not to have it scrutinized before it is public. My stories are plain, simple, unpretentious tales, and I dread having them seen before they are completed. <laughs> I could not write a serious romance under any other inducement than to save my life. And if it were absolutely necessary for me to sit down and stick to it and never relax into laughing at myself or at other people, I fear that I should be hung before I had completed the first chapter. I am well aware that Pride and Prejudice is rather too light and bright and sparkling to be truly popular. It wants to be stretched here and there with a chapter of two of sense, if it could be had. If not, of solemn, specious nonsense, a critique of writing and a work on Sir Walter Scott, an essay on Bonaparte, or anything that might bring the reader back with greater enjoyment to the playfulness and epigrammation of the general style. I also spend much time writing letters, particularly to my two delightful nieces, Anna and Caroline, one of whom is an aspiring authoress herself. And we never want for other amusements, particularly when visited by my nephews and nieces. Or Bilbo Catch, at which my nephew George is indefatigable. Spillikins, conundrums, riddles, paper ships with care watching the flow and ebb of the river, and the occasional stroll out do keep us well occupied. All in all, I believe my time here at Horton has been one of the most contented of my life. I am certainly saved all the bustle and trouble of living in a large town such as Bath or Southampton, particularly the trouble involving fashionable dress. <laughs> I have made myself two or three caps to wear of an evening since we arrived in Chawton, and they save me a world of trouble as to hairdressing. <laughs> For my long hair is plated up in back, and my short hair in front curls well enough to want no papering. At present I have no trouble beyond washing and brushing. But although I did initially publish my novels with anonymity, simply stating on the title page that they were by a lady, their publication does draw me up to London with increasing frequency to stay with my brother Henry and his wife Eliza. Henry has kindly agreed to aid me in the negotiations with my publishers. 
Now, I find that in London, one has to take great care not to be trampled to death amongst the crowds. <laughs> I recall writing to Cassandra upon my arrival there once. Here I am once again in this scene of dissipation and vice, and I already begin to feel my morals being corrupted. And yet I do acknowledge that there are some things to be enjoyed in the great metropolis. I certainly never miss an opportunity of attending the theater with Henry and Eliza. Oh, I was desperate to see Mrs. Siddons as Shakespeare's Constance in King John, and I was fascinated by a performance of Don Juan. I don't think I have ever seen a character on stage who is more compelling than that combination of cruelty and lust. And yet, there were some days when we had been out late to the play the night before and then up early that morning to go shopping and see the Indian jugglers when I was quite happy to be quiet until luncheon. We do also attend the picture galleries, but although I had some amusement at each, my preference for men and women always makes me spend more time observing the company than the paintings. Oh, although I was most delighted to find a perfect likeness of my Miss Bingley from Pride and Prejudice hanging amongst the portraits of the Spring Gardens exhibit. I searched for likenesses of Elizabeth and Jane Bennett as well, but without success. <laughs> Truly, my novels have become like my own dear children, and I am very happy to be here to see them safely sent out into the world. It was in 1803 that my brother Henry first submitted my novel Susan, which I now call Northanger Abbey, to Mr. Crawlsby. Mr. Crawlsby purchased the copyright, but has yet to publish the novel. And at present, I lack the funds to purchase the copyright back from him. So I suppose it languishes in an office drawer somewhere, that is, if he still has kept it at all. But I do hope that one day it will join my other novels on the bookseller's shelves. It was followed by Sense and Sensibility, which was sent to Mr. Edgerton, a much more reliable publisher, and appeared in print in 1811. Then shortly thereafter, Mr. Edgerton bought the copyright for Pride and Prejudice for £110, and it appeared in print the year after. Then Mansfield Park came shortly on its heels, and Emma is stated of a publication in November of this year. And now I have embarked on the Elliots. Although, if anyone has suggestions for a more compelling title, I would certainly be open to amending it. Oh, but I fear that I have been speaking for a terribly long time. I wonder if you have any questions of me. If so, I would certainly be delighted to chat. If you have any, please add them. Thank you so much, Miss Austin. We do have a few questions. Uh, this is Sarah Holliday from the library again, and I will, for uh, reasons of internet connection, remain a disembodied spirit. Um, so uh, one of our visitors asks whether you believe in ghosts. Ah, oh, that is an excellent question. <laughs> Certainly, I never object to a, well, I never object in general to allowing one's imagination to conjure up exciting images, provided one does not get carried away like Catherine Morland. And as the daughter of a good Church of England clergyman, I must say that I am discouraged from believing in, in spirits of that nature. <laughs> you spoke about your publisher purchasing copyright for your books. Have you had significant financial yield from them? Do they support you? I have had a surprising financial yield, I think more than I expected. Um, and it was certainly a part of my decision to attempt to publish my works. I knew that since I had turned down a perfectly good marriage proposal and was thus a burden on my family, I wanted to find a way to be independent and a way to support myself. And there are very few options open to ladies. I certainly had no inclinations towards being a governess. And so I turned my mind to writing and have been more successful than I expected to be, I must admit. So you mentioned the limited opportunities available to ladies with the colorful, expansive lives led by your brothers. Have you ever felt oppressed by the more limited horizons afforded a woman? 
I think I have often envied them. I don't know that I would say I have felt oppressed because I feel so fortunate that I've been able to live through their experience of the world. I'm very grateful to have brothers who've had these adventures and who are so kind in sharing them with me. Um, and certainly Cassandra and I both spend a great deal of time visiting Henry in London and with Edward and his family and have had many more opportunities than most ladies of our station can really expect to have, particularly spinster sisters, I'm afraid. Indeed. Speaking of sisters, Cassandra is such a specific name, it stands out among your siblings. Do you know why your parents chose it? Indeed, she was named after my mother, who is also named Cassandra Austin. Um, and it's a family name that goes back quite far. There is beginning, and I would hazard a guess, although I do not know for sure, that it has to do with these beautiful marbles the Countess Elgin has been bringing over from Athens. But there's an increasing interest in naming ladies with these spectacular names that are somewhat Greek in origin. Um, and I think that that may be where Cassandra came from, although I'm not entirely certain. I would have to ask my mother. Do you, in fact, intend to honor the Prince Regent with acknowledgement in Emma? Well, honoring the Prince Regent is a delicate question, is it not? <laughs> I feel that it was more of a command than a request that I dedicate my novel to him. However, as you may know, since you've asked the question, I do have mixed feelings about His Royal Highness and his morals. One of his country houses is not far from us. And I have heard stories that do not make me admire his moral fiber. I think he perhaps abuses his power. However, I'm certainly not in a situation to refuse a royal command, however politely it was presented. Thank you. Um, we do have a suggestion from one of our guests. If you are looking for an alternative title for your novel, The Elliots, she suggests <laughs> Persuasion. Aha, I rather like that. I shall have to sit with it for a bit and see how it feels. But I do enjoy There certainly are many people who are persuaded of a great many things in the course of the novel. Thank you. <laughs> how did you dream up the character of Mr. Darcy? Is he based on anyone in particular? Ah, that is an excellent question. I think he's a composite of a number of gentlemen of my acquaintance um, and of gentlemen of ladies' fancy, I must admit. Um, I did want to find a hero that could grow over the course of the novel. I didn't want to begin with just sort of this ideal gentleman who already happened to be wealthy and handsome and all the good things. I wanted to find what flaws there might be in an upper-class gentleman like that that could be amended by becoming closer friends with an intelligent lady. And so I think that I looked for qualities in a gentleman that could grow over the course of the novel and would be a good compliment to the character of Elizabeth, who I must say with all possible humility is the most delightful character who has ever appeared in print. I agree. I thank you. <laughs> Clearly, you are vivacious and you love company. Do you see yourself as an outgoing sort of individual or as an inward-looking person? I would say that I prefer to observe the world around me. And I find that in order to do that, I have to make the people around me comfortable. So perhaps, although I would prefer to be sitting quietly at home writing on my own, I've learned to go in company and try to draw people out. I like to observe and find characters for my books. Certainly. Have you heard of any Americans reading your novels and how they responded? I am not sure as yet. I understand that it is possible that um, Emma may be receiving publication in the United States, but that has not happened this year. I'm sure it will be at least a year away. So we shall see. But I, I would be delighted to share my work across the Atlantic, certainly. Do you have any advice for aspiring novelists, especially those who wish to write about romance? Well, I always say the advice that I gave to my niece is that one or two families in a quiet country village is the perfect place to begin. Um, I also have advised them frequently that you want to write about a place where you're familiar with the manners. My niece sent me a chapter of one of her novels that she decided to set in Ireland. And I wrote back and told her that she'd better bring it home to England because she didn't know the manners well enough there for it to be believable. So I would say certainly 
write what you know, but also have a firm enough foundation that you can then let your imagination run. But I think having that firm, um, firm foundation with the one or two families in the village that you know well gives it more grounding and more verisimilitude, which is very important. I think that's probably why people like my book so much. They can relate to the characters so, so easily. Excellent. So speaking of writing advice and how you write, you mentioned beginning your day with music. Can you talk about, are you playing it? Are you listening to someone else play? And then you spoke of writing until lunch and do you have other writing periods during the day? Indeed, well, I, I'm very fond of music. I play the pianoforte myself, although I would certainly not boast of my accomplishment. Um, but I enjoy spending much time playing and singing a little, although, as you heard, it is, it's not a focus of mine, but I enjoy it immensely. Um, I mainly write in the morning, and I am most fortunate in that dear Cassandra has taken over many of the household tasks that would otherwise distract me and keep me from writing. So really, she enables me to devote time to that work, which many ladies are not able to do. We really haven't a staff to look after us. So it's my mother, Cassandra, and I, and, and our friend, Martha. Um, so the mornings are mainly my writing time, and then I, I try to be useful to my family <laughs> for the rest of the day in general. Very good. Um, so one more question for Miss Austin. What do you think it is about your novels that makes people love them so much? I understand that the first edition of Pride and Prejudice sold out. It did, and I must say, no one was more surprised than I. I, I rather thought that it didn't have enough incident. You know, I mean, Sir Walter Scott is such a brilliant author, and I was most angry when he began writing novels. He's such a brilliant poet. He has no right to be so good at both. But I've always thought people love his novels because there is so much action and drama. But perhaps that's exactly what it is about my novels, is that they are more about the characters and they're about the people and they're not about grand historic events, but one can sit down with them and hopefully spend time with ones that you can feel your friends. Um, although I've been you know, very surprised that Mr. Murray agreed to publish Emma, to be quite honest, because I thought she was a heroine no one by, but one myself would much like. So we will see, but hopefully people will get along with her as well as they have Elizabeth and, and Fanny and Eleanor and Marianne. Wonderful. Uh, we have a couple of questions that I believe are addressed to Miss Rocklin, if that's agreeable. Certainly, I am happy to step out of <laughs> character now and yes, answer questions about the research or writing process or anything, mm -hmm. certainly. <laughs> Can you talk about what the balance is in your script between actual words of Jane Austen and your own uh, thoughts about how she would speak and what she would say? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, that was something that was very challenging um, for me to deal with because obviously no one expresses themselves as well as Jane Austen. <laughs> um, so there is, I'd say that there are a large number of quotes in the piece, which you, many of you probably recognized. Um, and I essentially just sort of tried to tie sort of favorite quotes and moments together with the narrative that I then created. Um, and the way I have my script set up, um, there are double quotation marks if Jane is aware that she's quoting somebody in this world of the play. And there are single quotation marks with footnotes for all of the places that she's just speaking, but they are quotes from her letters. And I did try to be sure that she wasn't saying a quote about a time or in a year where that would not be relevant. I tried to make sure that I kept all of her words in sort of the right time period as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are some lines that you just, you can't get anything better. <laughs> so yes. I had to put them in. <laughs> yes, we definitely heard some of those. Um, who made your clothes? Did you make them yourself? I am afraid I did not. That is a skill I lack. Um, but this gown came from the lovely Maddie's Millinery and Costumes, and they come every year to the Jane Austen Society AGMs. Um, and you can also find them on Instagram and on Facebook. And my favorite thing about this particular gown in the time of quarantine when I have no one to help me get dressed is that it does up in the front, which is really quite marvelous for Regency clothing. It's, it's perfectly accurate. It looks accurate. Um, but many of them have the buttons right in that place in your back where you cannot actually reach. So I'm very fond of this dress for that reason. Um, and then <laughs> my stays that I'm wearing, forgive me for mentioning my unmentionables under here, um, came from Maggie May Historic Clothing, which is another wonderful group online that does beautiful reproduction pieces. So I recommend both of them. <laughs> Excellent. Um, 
Can you speak a little bit more about Austin's relationship with her mother? Yes, I mean, it was very close. And I think, you know, I mean, one of the wonderful things is that she and Cassandra were encouraged to be intelligent, strong women because their mother was such an intelligent, strong woman. And when I mentioned in the play that she was known for creating, you know, occasional verse, it's true. And some of her poetry does survive and is quite good. Um, but I think that was also, you know, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that really motivated Jane to write because she felt this incredible responsibility to her mother and sister um, that sort of, you know, her mother had provided such a wonderful childhood for her growing up and that she as an adult wanted to contribute something to the family income um, and writing seemed to her to be the best option. And she was very lucky that, you know, her brother Henry was able and had the savvy to start the negotiations with publishers in London for her. Um, are the mannerisms of your performance drawn from contemporary accounts? Yes, I love looking at fashion plates um, and sort of trying to see what poses and postures and things are of the period. Um, you know, from the descriptions of Jane Austen, many people said that she was, you know, more quiet and reserved, but reading her letters, I feel like that is also partly sort of some of the revisionist um, Jane Austen that came from later biographies that wanted to make her seem more sedate and Victorian. Um, mm. And so in the play, I take a little bit liberty and give her a little more vivacity and sparkle, but I feel like um, her words certainly bear up that interpretation, even if people writing about her wanted us to believe that she was the very quiet, dour Regency matron. Mm. <laughs> and how long have you been working on and performing this play? I have been working on this one since, I think, 2011 or 12. Um, it was commissioned by a group up in Maine called the Swans Island Educational Society, um, which I was delighted to get to perform it for first. And I've sort of kept working with it and, and tweaking it ever since then. So it's, it's lovely being a one woman show. I can continue to tweak things and change things and update things every time I do it, which is kind of a lovely indulgence. <laughs> Um, and can you talk for just a moment about the other literary figures or historical figures that you've brought to life? Yes. So, I mean, one of the ones that's very close to my heart is, you know, the play that we were going to do a reading of here at the Society of Library in May, um, which I co-wrote with Ty Hallmark. And that play is about Marion Clover Adams, um, who is best known as the wife of Henry Adams, who many people think of as sort of the father of American history and who was a descendant of John Adams and John Quincy. Um, but Clover in her own right was a brilliant pioneer female photographer and was also a renowned society hostess in Washington and was very involved in the politics of the day. Um, and the tragedy of her life is that she actually ended up killing herself at a fairly young age by drinking potassium cyanide. Um, but the story of the play sort of goes through her development as an artist and trying to be an artist in a world that wasn't really ready for women to express themselves in that way. Um, yes. And so she's a, a fascinating character. Um, I think his other favorites are, are Charlotte Bronte, who's the other literary figure that I portray. Um, and then I, I think I have a fascination with the Adams women. I also work on Louisa Catherine Adams, who was John Quincy Adams' wife. Um, and up until recently, she was the only non-American born first lady. And her adventures with John Quincy in Russia and in Europe and then trying to acclimate to the young United States after being at the Russian court. I mean, they're just fabulous and fascinating. And I kind of recommend enough reading about her. Louisa Thomas has a brilliant biography of her that I enjoy very much. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I think we have time for another question or two. Um, if anyone in the audience has one that they'd like to toss in, uh, the chat is still open. Um, I also have another couple here. Uh, this one might be directed to Miss Austin, but it's up to you. <laughs> is it possible for you to name your favorite among your own novels, or would that be like asking which is your favorite child? Oh, that's an interesting question, and a good parallel, because she does frequently refer to her novels as her children. And I think that might have been her answer, although she certainly, I mean, she is the one that says that, you know, Elizabeth Bennet is the most delightful character to ever appear in print. Um... But she also always championed Mansfield Park, which even her mother apparently was not terribly keen on. Her mother thought that Fanny was a little bit too insipid. Um, 
So I think it might, it might be similar as with many writers, sort of whatever book you're working on at the time is your favorite. Um, ah, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, that is familiar to our writers in the audience. Um, so you mentioned uh, Tom Lefroy, and I think there may be one of these vulgar films um, related to him and that relationship, and I say related to somewhat in quotation marks. Um, are there any good Jane Austen portrayals on screen um, or your favorite adaptation or both? I know that second one is a tough one. <laughs> yes. Well, actually, funnily enough, the adaptation is rather the easiest because the Emma Thompson Sense and Sensibility is hands down my favorite. Mm. Um, I think it does a beautiful job of adapting the novel for film while still maintaining the integrity of the original story and characters, which is hard to come by in adaptations. Um, although I grew up on the Elizabeth Garvey and David Rintoul Pride and Prejudice, so it is very close to my heart, I must admit. Yes. That's the one that Faye Weldon adapted. Um, for Austin portrayals on screen, I think I am probably too picky. As you <laughs> mentioned, I was not terribly keen on the, the film you mentioned. Um, although Miss Austin regret, regrets with Olivia Williams is very nice, um, but I've not seen one yet that has, has blown me away. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I think that happens to a lot of us that the book is always better, but uh, still, it's fun to see the period portrayed. Um, one of our guests asked, uh, when did you first encounter Jane Austen? When did you fall in love with her work? I was very lucky in that I have a mother who also adores English literature. And so when I was a child, she set out to immerse me in all of it. Um, and I think I was about 12 or 13. Um, no, actually, I read Pride and Prejudice for the first time, I think, in fourth grade. And then we went to visit Chawton when I was 12. Um, but I just, I completely fell in love with the book. Um, and then being able to visit Chawton and see where Jane Austen had been living and been writing, you know, heightened everything. And I, I was completely, I wanted to be Elizabeth Garvey's Elizabeth Bennet when I grew up, watching that adaptation over and over and over again. Um, so it's been a lifelong <laughs> love affair with Jane Austen for sure. I've been a life member of the Jane Austen Society since I was a teenager. That's great. It's a beautiful thing. And can you talk a little bit more about your preparation, especially for this uh, solo show as an actress? Um, how do you polish your presentation? Do you try it out in front of a mirror? Or do you have a small but willing audience that you test things on? I mean, it's terrifying in that it's a double-edged sword because it's just me. So if I forget something or change something, no one else knows, but also <laughs> just me. So if I completely go up, there is no other actor on stage to very kindly give me a hint. Um, so it does take a lot of preparation. I've not practiced in front of a mirror because I'm not terribly keen on watching myself, but I've certainly enlisted friends to watch and give me feedback. Um, and I think I may, if this, show continues to develop and grow, it might be a good idea for me to actually hire a director to work with, um, mm. especially when I have a stage as opposed to trying to adapt it to a square. Um, but yeah, I'd love to sort of work on continuing to polish it. Wonderful. Well, I can certainly say that I enjoyed this very much and I am seeing some uh, acknowledgements of enjoyment in the chat, which I appreciate. Um, if anybody's got one last question, um, I can throw that in, but otherwise I think we are gently drawing to a close. Um, so I will uh, wish you all a good evening and thank you very much for being here, audience, and thank you very much for being here, Ms. Austin and Laura Rothman. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a delight. <laughs> good night. <laughs>